مرحباً و أهلاً بكم في برنامج داخل واشنطن أنا مضيفكم روبرت ساتلوف اجتياح روسيا لأوكرانيا مر عليه شهران في هذه الفترة تبدلت مؤذم السياسات الدولية التحديد من روسيا واكية الحرب في أوروبا أهمية خلف الناتو التحدي الذي يفرده اللاجئون الخوف من أصلها النووية مثل سكوت جدار برلين وإتداعات 11 سبتمبر سجل الإجتياح بداية حكبة جديدة مبهمة ماذا عن بكية العالم؟ قبل أحداث أوكرانيا التقديد الأكبر كان السن والأمريكيون كانوا يواجهون مواردهم نهو آسيا الخطران النويان الأذمان كان كوريا الشمالية والهدود بين الهند والباكستان وكان التبدل الاستراتيجي الكبير انسحاب أمريكا من أفغانستان بعد عشرين آما من الحرب ما هو التأثير الذي اكتثته أوكرانيا في الجهة الأخرى من العالم وكيف سيرود الأمريكيون لمناقشة هذه المسائل يسرني أن أستقبل الخبيرين الاستراتيجيين حول آسيا إس بول كابور ومايكل كوغلمن Welcome back to Dachl, Washington. Before two months ago, American foreign policy was focused on Asia, the threat of China, the pivot toward the Pacific. And then the Russian invasion of Ukraine changed all that, putting back on the map the old Cold War paradigm. Well, how do we mesh these two? How do things look from the other side of the world? I'm delighted today to welcome two of our nation's leading Asia experts, to look at American foreign policy and global challenges. I'm delighted to welcome Michael Kugelman and Paul Kapoor. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining Dachl, Washington. So like you, I am a regional expert um, uh, on a region other than Europe. From your perspective, how significant is Ukraine in your view? Uh, Michael, start with you. Well, it's very significant, uh, not just from a, a broad global perspective, but also, quite frankly, from an Asia perspective. Uh, I think it's quite notable that uh, ever since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, you've had several key powers in Asia, including Japan, for example, who have very explicitly linked the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine to um, developments in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and you know, the Japanese prime minister, for example, said that the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, essentially uh, posed a threat and was a concern for the notion of a free, open, rules-based Indo-Pacific region, which are the, 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 the key phrases that you hear uh, many of the, um, the Asian powers use to refer to the broad region, really re uh, referring to East Asia and Southeast Asia. But we're talking about uh, one of the most egregious um, aggressions the world has seen in many years. So what's happening in Ukraine matters for sure, um, whether you sit in Asia or whether you sit anywhere else. Paul, what's your view? I agree. It's very, it's, it's quite significant uh, on a number of levels. Uh, one is that it can distract U.S. attention from the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific region, um, which is the, the region to which we were, you know, pivoting, turning, uh, and had identified as, as our the major locus of our strategic concern. Um, also, you see fallout uh, from the Ukraine invasion in U.S. relationships with Asian countries like India. So it's, it's created real some tension and some headwinds in, in the relationship. Um, I don't think it's going to derail it, but, but it, uh, it has created some, some problems. And uh, so there's, there's spillover there. And also, uh, you know, the issue of sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, that's a, a global issue and, and um, examples from one part of the world can carry over to the other. So if the principle gets uh, established that it's okay or, or that you can get away with um, achieving your revisionist aims through um, invasion and, and coercion and, and an outright force, um, then that could have implications for, say, how China thinks about some of its revisionist uh, aims in, in Asia as well. All right, let's take a closer look 
um, adversaries, allies, the whole gamut of, of countries in the Indo-Pacific and the Asia region. Let's start with adversary number one. Foremost is obviously China. Paul, if you're in Beijing, how has the um, uh, the Russian invasion changed the way you're looking at your national security, your foreign policy, your national ambitions? Well, it has uh, the the Ukraine invasion has potentially uh, helped to push Russia and and China together at some level. They both have. You know, these are birds of a feather in some ways, authoritarian states that are unhappy with the global order that the United States has established. They want to would like to undo that liberal order or make sure that it doesn't reach into the and for China, especially we'll make sure it doesn't reach into the uh, into the Indo-Pacific. And uh, if the as I said earlier, if the principle gets established that revisionist aims can be achieved through force. Uh, and, and there's not too much of a price to pay for it, um, then that could have an emboldening effect for sure, because China has revisionist aims, of course, with Taiwan, but also um, along the border with India and other places as well. Um, that said, the, the, the major blowback that Russia is suffering from, uh, from the Ukraine invasion, I think also will give China some pause. And uh, you know, they're going to have to see uh, how this turns out and, and whether this is something that, that is uh, you know, an attractive model or, or not. I mean, uh, Michael, I can't imagine that the Chinese are thrilled with the fact that the Russians have united NATO in a way that no one has seen um, uh, the alliance um, so cohesive and resilient in years. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that China's reaction to uh, the invasion has been very nuanced. Uh, you know, certainly many have argued that China is one of the one of the few winners uh, from this war in the sense that it could drive Russia uh, closer into China's arms, which could give China a significant degree of leverage over Russia. And of course, China and Russia had been developing a, a closer partnership in the weeks leading up to the invasion. Um, but then again, I don't know if China would want Russia to become a ward of the Chinese state. Just like I don't know if Beijing is particularly comfortable with the fact that North Korea is heavily dependent on China. Does China really want to have these pariah states dependent on it so heavily? heavily? And also, you know, China has a broad ambition and a broad goal of um, investing, uh, particularly in infrastructure uh, across the world as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, prolonged war right in the middle of Europe does not serve China's interests. China wants to be investing in those areas, including Ukraine and in much of Europe. So in that sense, you know, a war in Europe and God forbid a third world war, if that were to happen, that's not what China wants. That would really be a big blow to its interests, which entail uh, enough stability uh, in key regions of the world to allow it to build out its Belt and Road Initiative to continue on its path to becoming an economic superpower. So if, if, if China is having a bit of ambivalence about, about this, um, I would imagine Taiwan has a bit of ambivalence about what's going on in, in Ukraine as well. Um, uh, Michael, if you're sitting in in, in, in Taiwan, and you're looking at the Ukraine story, is this a, a good news story that the world is, is supporting Ukraine, or a bad news story that the world is letting Ukraine fight to the last Ukrainian? Well, certainly, I think in Taiwan, there's concern about the implications of this, uh, this Russian invasion um, of Ukraine and how it could impact uh, the calculations of the Chinese government, uh, the PRC government, uh, for sure. And I think also there's concern in Taiwan, as I think Paul had mentioned before, that there's the risk that the uh, the, the attention of, of the U.S. and like-minded Western countries could be distracted from what China is doing in the South China Sea or potentially uh, what it could be thinking about doing in Taiwan. I'm not, though, if, I'm not sure I would go so far as to suggest that China is sufficiently emboldened by what Russia has done in Ukraine to think that it's going to now go barge into Taiwan or do something significant uh, there. Yes, the US and its partners were unable to deter the Russian aggression, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it's a very different story with China and Taiwan. I think that it may be wrong to analogize the two too closely. Um, but yeah, for sure, I mean, given what's, what China's been doing, uh, the provocations that China's been staging around Taiwan and the region, it's only natural that many people in Taiwan would be very concerned about the potential emboldening effect that the Russian inv invasion of Ukraine could have on chi potential Chinese activities uh, in, in Taiwan and the surrounding areas. Paul, do the Taiwanese believe that they have a different type of commitment to their defense 
than the Ukrainians um, uh, that we now know that you know we have or we didn't really have to the defense of Ukraine? Well, the U.S. commitment has always been uh, characterized by what's called strategic ambiguity, which is uh, a, a sense that there's a good chance the United States would respond to an attack on Taiwan, but no, but we're not promising. <laughs> so, so the you know the desire... can't take that to the bank, though, can you? No, you can't. Um, but it's perhaps more than the Ukrainians had. So I think, um, you know, I think our long term strategic commitment to Taiwan has been more robust than any commitment that we had to Ukraine. And so if we're willing to support the Ukrainians to the degree that we are, you know, certainly the Taiwanese could, could expect more. Although, as you say, you know, nothing that you can 100 percent take to the bank. Um, but, you know, there's there this the Ukraine situation pulls in a couple of different directions. It could have an emboldening effect on China. Um, as Michael said, it probably that doesn't mean that China thinks it can just run roughshod over Ukraine, uh, but it, but it, there could be an emboldening effect. On the other hand, uh, the cost that Russia has paid for the Ukraine invasion, which have been significant, um, significant economic costs, a significant costs in terms of uh, human costs with, with their military uh, equipment and so on, um, and, and being, you know, every day sort of becoming more and more of a pariah state. Um, that's not something that's attractive to China. So that could be cautioning as well. So there, there, you know, it, it pulls in a couple of different directions, but certainly, you know, certainly worrisome. Um, let's ask about our allies, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea. Um, uh, uh, what are they taking away from, from, uh, from, we're only two months in, but what are they taking away so far from the Russian invasion, Michael? Well, I mean, those countries that you mentioned, those uh, U.S. treaty allies in Asia, uh, have been very much on the same page as the United States, uh, and coming out in support of the strongest form of sanctions, coming out with the strongest condemnations uh, of the Russian invasion. And I, I think that's been quite uh, consistent, that we've seen that ever since the invasion uh, began. Uh, now, you know, the one country you don't mention, maybe we're going to get into this later, uh, is India, which is not an ally of the U.S., but it's a close partner. India, of course, has taken a very different position. But if you look at uh, you know, America's closest, most long-established uh, treaty allies uh, in, in Asia and in the Indo-Pacific, they're pretty much all on the same page. And certainly a number of US allies have not been on the same page completely with the US, particularly the NATO partners, right? Uh, many of the European countries are so heavily dependent on Russian energy that they haven't been willing to agree to the types of sanctions uh, that the U.S. would like to see. But with Australia, with Japan, with South Korea, very different story. They're all operating in lockstep with the United States in, uh, in taking the most maximalist position possible, condemning Russia in the strongest terms, and pushing forward, or wanting to push forward with the strongest form of sanctions possible. I mean, I, I, I read an interview uh, just this week with the Australian Minister of Defense. I, mean, I don't know anything about East Asian politics, but uh, I'm told that he's a serious fellow in which he said, we need to prepare for war, that um, uh, 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 what we're seeing in Ukraine is one thing and what the Chinese are planning in our region is, is, is more of the same and we need to prepare for war, which is remarkably strong words, um, uh, pretty powerful. Uh, Paul, is this a serious reality? Well, the Australians are very concerned about China. Um, they've been subjected to Chinese economic coercion. They've watched uh, China's military capabilities grow. And uh, they're aware of the fact that, that the Chinese have uh, ambitions in the region that are incompatible with, with uh, Australia's views as, as to how uh, the Indo-Pacific should evolve in, in more of this sort of liberal, free and open uh, direction. But I think it, it's true that the, the um, our treaty allies in the Asia Pacific region have been uh, very uh, forthright about uh, supporting the United States position, and, and they've really marched in, in lockstep. And I think it's because they see linkage between what's happening in Europe and what could happen in in the Indo Pacific. Um, so they don't they don't want uh, Ukraine to be an example for a revisionist China as to what it might be able to get away with uh, in the Indo Pacific. And so they're they're uh, really their response has been really strong. All right, when we come back after the break, we're going to ask the big picture questions, such as, can America really prepare effectively to fight the potential of war in Europe and the potential for war in the Indo-Pacific? When we come back after the break. Again, our guests today include... S. Paul Kapoor is professor 
at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, training America's naval officers. Previously, he was a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and he served on the State Department's policy planning staff. Also joining us is Michael Kugelman, an Asia scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington. His work has been seen in the New York Times, foreign policy, foreign affairs, and other prestigious foreign policy publications. All right, um, Michael, let's let's begin with you. Uh, both of you mentioned India, um, huge power in Asia, hedging quite a bit in terms of the Ukraine crisis. How do we read this and what impact does this have in uh, security in uh, the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, well, those that uh, study Indian foreign policy would not be surprised by this position. Uh, India has never condemned Russian aggressions. Uh, it has never voted against Russia uh, at the United Nations, or very rarely. And that's because of the longstanding partnership with Russia that goes back to the early days of the Cold War. And India sees Russia as a country that is willing to uh, help it out on the world stage, including uh, voting uh, at the UN in ways that benefit India's interests, including on issues like Kashmir. Um, but more immediately uh, right now, India is heavily dependent on Russian arms. Um, and at a moment when India believes it faces a, a two-front threat uh, from China and also from Pakistan, it can't afford to risk jeopardizing its access to those arms by going against Russia. And finally, you know, India has this longstanding uh, policy of what used to be non-alignment is now referred to as strategic autonomy. India doesn't like to be seen as... as as taking the side of a, of a major power, including the United States, because it wants to be able to maintain the sufficient amount of flexibility and independence in its foreign policy. So it doesn't go for these moral type explanations where you, one would say, well, you have this horrible invasion, this cold blooded invasion of Ukraine. Why would India not want to condemn it? You know, India sort of thinks differently uh, about that in that sense. So that's an important point to put out there. Um, it certainly is concerning for the US government. Uh, I do think Washington understands India's position, but I think what we'll see in the coming weeks and months are efforts by the Biden administration to try to convince India that in the long term, Russia is not, is, will not be as dependable of a security partner for India as it used to be, especially because it'll be sanctioned, cash-strapped, will lack the ability to produce and send weaponry um, to, uh, to India as it has in the past. But you know, make no mistake, the U.S. continues to look at India as a key player in the Indo-Pacific region, as, as really as the biggest, as Washington's biggest strategic bet in South Asia, as the country to help the U.S. counter Chinese power. But there have been some disagreements and views between New Delhi and Washington as to what specifically, what specific role India should play in that regard. But in terms of the Ukraine crisis, you know, I think that um, it would be unrealistic to expect India to change its mind. Um, but again, since this is such a, an, an aggressive aggression, so to speak, uh, since the U.S. and India are very close now, and since the Biden administration has been calling on the world's democracies to band together to counter Russia, this is why there's a lot of unhappiness uh, in Washington and other Western capitals because of India's position. I mean, is there going to be some fallout in the relationship, Paul, because the Indians have been so standoffish and hedging um, uh, on Ukraine? Well, as I mentioned, there's been headwinds for sure, heartburn, whatever you want to say. Um, there, there, unhappiness uh, on the part of the U U.S. and some of the um, U.S. partners and allies as well because of India's hedging on this. Um, as Rob said, this is this is part of a long-standing um, Indian sort of strategic tradition of of wanting to maintain strategic autonomy, despite the fact that it's gotten much closer to the U.S. over the years, and also a long-standing relationship with Russia, a defense relationship that's that's going to be you know the Indians can't change that quickly. Probably sixty to seventy percent of their inventory, their their military inventory is uh, Russian sourced. So. Um, that's something that they can diversify over time. I think they've, they've started doing that already. Uh, they want to do more of that, but it's, it's going to take some time. And the U.S., I think, has to be realistic about the fact that um, India is going to continue the relationship with Russia, if, even if it's somewhat uh, downgraded. And it's going to take a while before it's able to get on board with um, you know, United States policies. All right, I'm hearing that partners and alliances are the key words. Uh, thank you both uh, for joining me, Paul Kapoor, Michael Kugelman. 
for helping look at the Ukraine crisis through the Asian lens. Thank you for joining us on Dachel, Washington. During a recent school vacation, I traveled to France with my youngest son. Now 14 years old, he hadn't been there since he was just eight months old. So it was time to reintroduce him to the wonders of that beautiful country. We devoted half our trip to history when a terrific tour guide escorted us around Normandy for us to learn firsthand the remarkable story of the complex and bloody battle that changed the course of history and began the long march toward the liberation of Europe 78 years ago. But if history was everywhere, politics was everywhere too, as we traveled to France in the final days of its fateful presidential election campaign. Fateful is not a word I use lightly. Every campaign is important, but not everyone is fateful with the fundamental course of nations at stake. At this moment, at this time, when the forces of darkness, brutality, and authoritarianism are doing their best to extinguish freedom and democracy in Ukraine, the French election did come at a truly fateful moment. But the moment alone was not fateful. The choice was fateful, a choice between a status quo centrist aiming for his second term, Emmanuel Macron, and an extreme right winger running to unseat him, Marine Le Pen. Yes, this is the softer, gentler Marine Le Pen, a woman of the people, as she liked to remind her supporters. But beneath the veneer, it is the same extreme nationalist, the same Putin admirer that French voters have come to know over the past decade and a half. There is much to critique in the European Union, as the British people did when they opted to leave a couple of years ago, though many are having buyer's remorse. But for all the grousing, the EU is a huge net plus to the world, and France is at its core. To have a leader of France who opposes the European Union, wants out of NATO, wants to befriend Putin, and wants to distance from America would have been a terrible blow, especially at what I have called this fateful time. That's the view of Marie Le Pen. For American interests, her election would have been a disaster. I have to admit, after the first round of the presidential election, when Macron, the incumbent, received only 28% of the vote to Le Pen's 23, I was worried. Where would those other 49% of voters go? Would they even show up? Could Le Pen sneak into power? Would Putin have an ally as the president of France? In the end, the outcome was stunning. In America, we're used to elections decided by a handful of votes, just a few sometimes. A 5% victory for us is a landslide. But the French were clear and unmistakable, re-electing Macron with a 58.5 to 41.5% majority, a 17% difference, something we haven't seen in America since 1984. So, viva la France. Thank you for your unambiguous vote. It doesn't solve a problem, but it ensures that the ones we already have don't get immeasurably worse. Basalna in al Khitam Hadihil Halkam in Baranamaj Dakal Washington. In Kanit Ladekum Eya Asila O Ta'ali Kat, how Hadihil Baranamaj, while Bil Achas Bishan El Ta'athir al Alami Lil Harab El Rusia Ala Ukrania. Tawasalu Mai Rajaan Aber Twitter Ala hashtag inside Washington. O Tarasaluni Mubasharatan Ala Rabbit at Rob Satloff. Arakum Philos Boil Kadim Hatadelika Hain Shukran Lakum Wa Ila Lakah.